Good morning, everybody. I'm here with Mark. He's, he's been working on promise theory for a long time in, in this smart space time. And um, I wanted to get his perspective on agent architectures. And the reason why this is important today is because we have all these new frameworks for large language models. They tend to be very rudimentary in the way they construct a group of agents in that they would wire it together in kind of like a chain. Yeah. So we have frameworks blank chain and llama index where uh, just like a data flow. And I always felt that this was kind of, I mean, basic in the way to do it. We've gone through this decades ago. We built workflows and we've all found these workflows to be brittle. Mark here is hoping that he could, um, lend some of his uh, perspective in, in promise theory to agents that collaboratively work together in a, a more robust way. I should start with a little bit of background about my myself to to explain where this this came from. So I'm by by education, if you like, or by training, I'm a, a physicist, a theoretical physicist, quantum physicist, I suppose you would say now. And I drifted into IT in the 90s because I was interested in understanding how computers worked, not in the sense that we, we would say today, you know, you program it to do this and therefore it does that, which is, you know, an approximation to the truth at best. Um, especially when you reach systems at scale, computers don't always do precisely what we thought we told them to do. They do a bunch of other things because they're being influenced by other computers, by users, by interactions with the network and all kinds of other things. So my, my interest as a physicist in computers was to describe them as you would describe any natural phenomenon. And so I wanted to apply all the kind of tools that we use in physics to, you know, determinism, predictability, statistical mechanics, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So in physics, we've developed a huge number of tools to describe how things, how stuff happens. That's what physics is. And so I, I started writing down everything that I could think of about how computers worked, and I realized there was something missing. You know, after you've done all the the graph theory and the game theory and the the predictive of this and the and the what not that, there's still something left, and that is what is the purpose of IT. It, we have it for a purpose as we design and build any kind of tooling or technology. It has a purpose and and we so we need to be able to understand what is it for. And I thought about this for a long time and I came up with this idea that uh, we need to represent intentions uh, or if you like promises. A promise is basically a declaration of our intent to do something. And so this notion of promises being important in describing computers became a way for me to, to merge together all of the kind of tools that I would know from physics about prediction with the things that you don't really talk about in physics, which is what are things for? You know, in physics, things aren't for anything, they just are. So there's no, no question about why why does the atom do this or that? You simply say it's on a trajectory in this direction. And in a similar way, we can deal with intent as a kind of a directionality or an, an alignment of direction in a kind of abstract space, which I call the space of promises. And so this notion of promise theory emerged in which you would want to describe things, whatever things are, in terms of the kinds of trajectories they have in this abstract space of accomplishing goals or outcomes. And these are the promises that we want to represent, intentions. So what are these entities? You know, what are these things? <coughs> Pardon me. Well, there are many things. Obviously, a computer is an entity, but also a software agent is, is a thing. A process is a thing. And just as in physics, we have... We tend to think about objects as, you know, bodies, atoms, electrons, masses. We have a materialistic view of things, but actually, if you look at what's going on in the world, 
we're really looking to describe processes. And these entities that we see are somehow just states in a space of states. So the fact that you have an electron or not an electron is just a state of space and time. Just as whether or not you have a program running, you know, um, Twitter or something, it's just an agent running on some machine somewhere, you either have it or you don't. So almost at some level, a kind of a flag saying, I'm Twitter, I'm here, or I'm a process that's uh, connecting to Twitter and I'm here. So that's, we can represent that as a promise being made by this particular region of computational space and time. So there's a way of abstracting the discussion of computation in terms of locations and times and the kinds of properties those locations and times express, which is sort of subtly different from saying we have a computer and it's running a program, you know, because you could always move the computer or you could move the process. A bunch of different things could change. So if we simply have a way of parameterizing stuff that happens as we would parameterize stuff that happens in physics, then we need a notion of kind of space and time. Where are things located? When do things happen? And then what are those attributes or promises that can be kept? In other words, what are the processes that are ongoing in these locations? And to what extent do the, are these encapsulated at a single location or spread across a bunch of locations in a distributed way? And of course, all these words make sense to, to computer scientists as well. We use slightly different words than we do in physics. Instead of coordinates, we'll talk about a, a network location or a host or a container or something like this. And instead of a trajectory, we'll talk about a process, which may be localized or distributed. So promise theory came out of this kind of thinking, and it was really about formalizing these ways of thinking in a simple way. Now, the thing that's important in physics is locality, how localized things are or how distributed they are, because we know there's a finite speed of communication and this limits the kind of processes that we can have and how quickly a signal can be sent from one place to another. In a similar way, we have limitations in computing. Some of them are to do with you know, physics, but others are to do with the rate at which a process may be scheduled. So we need to be able to represent those things. And instead of talking about locality in IT, we tend to talk about autonomy, which is a form of localization. You know, how independent is one process compared to another? Can it run completely without any input from others? Or does it depend on dependencies in terms of resources, memory, CPU? Or does it depend on actual data being funneled from another source, maybe a database or you know, some other kind of program? So because of the interactions between these entities in a network in computing, we can talk about how autonomous is a system versus how interdependent is a system. Now I put my physics brain, my physics hat back on and I say, okay, well, if we want to describe this formally, then, then the logical way to do this is to build from the bottom up, just as we build from the bottom up with atoms. Because there will always be some point at which you can break the system into smaller and smaller parts. In order to see how it works, you need to put them back together again in terms of these basic parts. But there are basic indivisible things. And to some extent, you can choose what these things are, right? So you can say that the indivisible things in physics are atoms, or you could say they are capacitors and transistors, or you know, you can take each scale as a new set of entities or things that make certain kinds of promises and then piece them together in different ways. And so this is how we think about promises in computing as well. We have some set of entities, which I call agents. They have interior capabilities. You know, it might just simply be saying, I am a program that does Twitter, or it might be a complex algorithm that's internalized in this, this thing. So when you feed something into it, something pops out of it the other side. And that's a kind of promise to accept and a promise to, to produce something based on that thing that was accepted, input, output. So we can build up the notion of components and collaborative agents in a very general way. And 
the, the bottom-up assumption is that each of these agents starts out being basically autonomous. So everything starts out, its ground state, if you will, is that it doesn't interact with anything. Nobody can force it to do anything it doesn't want to do. It simply exists and it has the capabilities that it has. It either can or it can't do certain things. And then you can ask what happens if we try to put these things together and then they voluntarily give up part of that autonomy by promising to work with something else, by promising to accept data from another, or by promising to deliver an outcome based on the other things. And so there's an algebra of rules that you can build up starting from these ultimately independent autonomous agents by virtue of making promises, they give up part of that autonomy mm -hmm. and therefore become part of a greater whole. And then, of course, you can decide that you can put together four agents and that would be a new agent, a super agent, mm -hmm. formed from the composition of those things. And so compositionality is also part of the story. And we can go from atoms to transistors to computers and so on. So that's kind of a lightning tour of promise theory. I'm hearing your description, I can make the analogy with today's like just model systems. So in today's systems like GPT-4, there's this concept of an assistant or a tool or a plugin. And what they do is the tool or plugin advertises itself. So it presents itself at, as an API to the large, large language model. So, so there are signatures or methods that are explained in natural language that tells the large language model what the function of that that tool is so for example like a, what is to click something and so forth it's presented as as kind of an api an interface with documentation if we were to go with the promise theory primitives is there more just an api that more information that we're provided so um so an api and promise theory would be a set of promises to accept something so you would I would promise to accept certain inputs from somebody mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. in a structured way. The question becomes, what is the language we use to represent those inputs or features, if you will? In promise theory, we think of some kind of space of intentions, intentionality. And this, I guess, in a, you know, an AI kind of way, corresponds to the feature space in, a, in some learning system. Uh, in uh, say a neural network or something where you have, you know, a hundred thousand uh, abstract directions in some thing and you, you try to position or place things in this space and with some separability based on uh, what kinds of promises you want to keep. Normally in promise theory, you would, you would try to keep this language rather small and predictable because you're often working with ideas that are already kind of preconceived in, in some way. So you restrict to a small set of symbols or states that that represent the language. And certainly in an API at the computing level, you know, there are you you connect to a thing and then you you start a session and you send it certain commands and these commands are rather simple. The data associated with the commands might be more complex. And so you may have multiple languages involved in a computational sense to do this. But in what sort of distinguishes this in, in machine learning is that you, when, you're, when you're doing machine learning, you basically don't know the language that you're learning in advance. So you're, you're looking for some way to just spread things out in some higher dimensional space. And you hope that there will be some structures that you can use to reproduce uh, certain features um, based on that dimensionality. That leads to all kinds of problems, as, as you know well. But the the smaller you can keep the dimensionality of the space, the more predictability you can have. Mm -hmm. And the, the closer you remain to a computational process, a deterministic computational mm -hmm. process in the, in the Turing sense, right? Because Basically, all communicative acts are languages of some kind, but the size of those languages becomes important. And the way that we evaluate those languages becomes important. So we know from the Chomsky hierarchy that 
the basic languages of the, the regular languages, which are basically just collections of strings created ad nauseum. Mm -hmm. So you just write down every possible thing you could say in a long list. And that's one way to describe a language. That's almost the machine learning way, if you like. And then you you can use memory in smart ways to build structures and, and form grammars mm -hmm. and order things. And, and so through those dependencies and orderings, you add more and more structure until you end mm -hmm. up with formal, formally computable languages, which are the Turing languages, where you basically have computer programs, you know, Python or something. And so what uh, what we do in machine learning is is to try to span that gap across the Trotsky hierarchy from mm -hmm. by using what we know or as little as possible of computability because we don't quite know what the the rules are necessarily, and then we try to infer the rules from uh, a large regular data set uh, by looking for the patterns and then often placing them in some sort of coordinate system, which is this uh, feature vector and feature space. Um, and so promise theory kind of aligns with that thinking rather well, because that is also what you do in, in a system of intent, mm -hmm. identifying directions in, in a certain space with certain kinds of intent, which in turn, you could sort of argue represents certain kinds of process in a computer program. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a kind of um, an implicit mapping between a structured set of potentially semi-deterministic or deterministic processes and locations in a vector space, uh, mm -hmm. which you know, accumulate in some way. In problems theory, you have these primitives that are based on these intentions, and you have some way to compose the intentions together, some algebra for it so that the composition of intentions ideally would align with some sort of higher level intention. So you're composing intentions to create a higher level goal. I'm thinking from the point of view of someone who is a composing these systems, a developer, right, that he would be able to know how to compose these uh, to create a system that involves multiple agents in a manner that would be r robust enough it the final intent, the higher level, or possibly even AI, the large language model, being able to do it so itself. Right? So it seems to me that this is a prescription to a kind of higher level groups of agents, rather mm -hmm. than just stitching them together and saying, this follows this, you would have the agents advertising what they would accept, I believe. Mm -hmm. And do they have to tell you what they're capable of doing? Well, maybe, maybe not. But if they don't tell you, then you can't make any kind of predictions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's always helpful when agents expose their capabilities somehow externally. If they act as black boxes without yeah. kind of externalizing their promises, then then you then it's pretty much non-deterministic. Right. What what is the what is the primary difference uh, uh, between the specifications that you have in promise theory as compared to a regular uh, interface API, the kind that you will see in Java or Corvo or any of those um, uh, distributed uh, types of specifications? Well, as I said, uh, an API is, is just a, a special case of, of a promise, a set of promises to accept. Uh, and that can be represented in any language. You know, in biology, mm -hmm. for instance, cells uh, advertise their capabilities with, uh, with molecular receptors. Mm -hmm. You know, I can accept this, uh, this kind of protein connecting to me and then we can dock and bond together and form a new kind of a, a thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and in the same way computers do that with apis um, and you hope that what one agent is promising to offer or send can dock with what is being accepted otherwise they they just pass each other in the night and nothing happens mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so there's a kind of um the compatibility between mm -hmm. um, different promises is, is the essence of it. And promise theory is kind of has its own way of talking about this, but of course there is no, obviously it's, there's no difference between a promise theory specification and a specification in any other language, except mm -hmm. the details of how you represent it. Um, 
But what promise theory does for you is it tells you because of its assumptions about autonomy and building from the bottom up, it tells you what are the necessary and sufficient conditions perhaps to be able to accomplish a new kind of promise based on some mm -hmm. component promises when you compose them, which you can't necessarily do in a simple way with any just any language because um, because you don't necessarily know what's hidden inside mm -hmm. all the bits. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it basically but, tells you what you can and can't expect. Right, but uh, because promise theory makes the uh, fundamental assumption of autonomy of the agents, I would presume that leads to a kind of robustness in the execution or the employment of these agents. Well, again, that depends on the kind of promises they make. If um, if if agents bind together, we talk about weak and strong binding. Mm -hmm. If they're weakly bound, they're quite tolerant of each other's mistakes and, and mm -hmm. failures to 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 deliver. But if they're strongly dependent on each other, so that one agent literally fails if the thing it depends on fails, mm -hmm. then, then faults propagate very rapidly and very. Um, strictly uh, from one thing to another, the, and systems become brittle. Mm -hmm. It's, again, very like physics of atoms. If if the bindings between atoms are strong, things tend to fail brittle and shatter into pieces mm -hmm. rather than things that are sort of gooey and stretchy and, and can right. and, uh, be elastic. So, Is the tightness of coupling or the loose coupledness of uh, coupling expressed in the actual promises, or is it something that is implicitly derived? Yeah, you would you would express that in the in the range of things. You know, you would promise to accept a range of mm -hmm. possible things. You normally, <clears throat> if you only accept one thing, you know, it has to be exactly that. Then you're pretty brittle. Mm -hmm. It's easy mm -hmm. to fail to deliver exactly on your somebody's expectation. But if you're saying, "Well, I'll take this more or less. And give me what. Give me give me your best shot." Mm -hmm. Then that's pretty adaptable and resilient to, you know variability in the input so it's that ability to be tolerant of others um mm -hmm. either humans or machine mm -hmm. um variable quality if you're able to accept variable quality and make use of it then that makes you weakly coupled and, and robust and resilient you had this notion in smart space time of which i find very interesting is the, this idea of virtual motion could you explain that yeah virtual motion is what we see an awful lot of the time all around us, but we don't really think about it. You know, in physics, we talk about, because we're materialistic, we think about bodies. So you have a body and it, it moves through space. And we have this abstraction about what space is, you know, it's all around us. And then you have bodies and they, and this is motion in space. But we have other kinds of ways of moving things too, in which you don't necessarily think of the the body moving, but as something that it represents moving. So like in a football stadium, you know, when a sports stadium, uh, you know, they have these waves uh, where people will throw their hands up and then the next person will do it and these waves will go all the way around the stadium. That's virtual motion, right? Nobody is moving, but the the phenomenon is moving. So the, the signal is moving without the motion of a body, material body. And you could say any wave, water waves, radio waves, you know, any kind of wave is basically the motion of a signal without the motion of the medium on which it, which is reflecting that signal. And it's something like a relay race. So, you know, you, you have a, a bunch of people handing, handing something to the next guy and then the next guy like the baton in a race mm -hmm. you have somebody runs they hand the baton and the next person goes and so on that's a form of virtual motion it's actually a physical baton being passed but it could be a you could whisper something right you could mm -hmm. whisper an idea in somebody's ear like the game of chinese whispers or whatever we call it um and that is essentially virtual motion where instead of passing something material or something we believe is an agent mm -hmm on some level, we pass a promise from one agent to another. Mm -hmm. um, oh, somebody drilling behind me. I hope this doesn't mess up the sound. Oh, I can't hear it, so that's fine. Okay, that's good. So that's that's virtual motion. And of course, this becomes very important in the cloud because now 
um, we have many levels of virtuality, vir virtuality and virtuality in the cloud. We have so-called physical hosts, computers, which are basically electric circuits that promise electrical stuff, data promises. And then we run programs based on those signals, which form new computers, virtual computers, which run another layer of virtual programs, which run containers, which run, you know, so there are many levels of virtualization happening. And you want to say things might be moving around. Is it data? Uh, at what level is the actual virtual machine itself just data in somebody else's process? You know, turtles all the way down or virtual machines mm -hmm, all the way down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so virtual motion, to be able to describe that, that's really important. And it turns out that if you if you even go to something like quantum computing or quantum mechanics, uh, we can't actually say with certainty that um, quantum phenomena are not themselves virtual phenomena. And that space, all the things we think are real are in fact virtual processes running on some fixed substrate underneath. It's not quite the same as people who, who want to say that we're living in a simulation, but mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. saying that, you know, in Einstein's relativity theory, he made a, a point that nothing can, nothing, no space-time point is an absolute thing. Well, that's true of virtual processes. Virtual processes don't have an absolute fixed location, but underneath them, there might be a, a set of physical computers that do have a, mm -hmm. an absolute mm -hmm. And just in the same way, you know, on the, onto the quantum level, there might be absolute fixed certain things that all of our phenomena are running on and moving mm -hmm. around, giving the illusion of that uh, relativity. So this ability to form abstractions and decouple them is really mm -hmm. important the way we describe phenomena. Um, and often what gets people stuck in physics and in computing mm -hmm. is People tend to as associate with one particular level in this in this mm -hmm. section and say, well, I want to understand everything from this level. Mm -hmm. And then they forget about the others. Mm -hmm. and then things get very complicated because they can't mm -hmm. quite understand the causality of what's going on. So at different levels, you have this kind of virtualization of motion. How does it also relate to the notion of locality that you brought up earlier? Doesn't look it doesn't locality disappear or is locality different at different levels? Locality is at different levels. So uh, just as you um, so at your most atomic level on on any scale, the smallest pieces that you can break something into in at, on some level with say call it I say it's atoms, uh, that is your most local, the most local you can make something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's no some, nothing smaller than that. You may later discover that there is something smaller than that, you know, your subatomic level and so on. But that, mm -hmm. if you don't know that, it, it might be, still be a consistent assumption to say that that smallest thing still works for composing things on a higher level. And this is the same idea as in the OSI, OC hierarchy mm -hmm. networking, right? You start with your physical layer, then you have your your Mac Mac addresses, Ethernet layer, and you have TCP IP layers, and so on, all the way up to HTTP, and so on. Um, at each level, the thing underneath is sort of atomic with respect to the thing above it. Mm -hmm. But you might still see some funny stuff going on that you can't quite predict because there's still something underneath it that you don't know about, or vice versa. That uh, there are f connections being made at HTTP level, which are causing these weird flows of TCP IP. Where, do, where does that come from? We don't know. Mm -hmm. It's because of some boundary conditions on another scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is, again, this is exactly how biology works. It's a multi-scale mm -hmm. phenomenon. You can't understand biology just at the level of cells. Mm -hmm. We have to say, well, cells form organs, organs form structures and systems, mm -hmm. form organisms, organisms form species, uh, ecosystems, right. and so on. And at each level, there are bits that you can where you can localize certain phenomena that seem to be important at that level. But each of those phenomena may themselves be complex systems of phenomena on a lower level. So you're sort of implying with all these multiple levels of virtuality that uh, 
that at the top level, you have some sort of locality, say a biological agent, and it's, it has its own look, interior, its own locality. It does have a top-down causal influence with everything underneath going downward. Does, does your framework take that into account, how the, the higher level locality influences the behavior at the lower levels? This is what I refer to as the separation of scales. Mm-hmm. And this has to do with this decoupling. So clearly, anything that happens on a higher level can also be represented in terms of lower level things. Mm-hmm. So let's say we have a boundary, or let's say we have a you know web server HTTP interaction. Um, we can always represent that in terms of um, iPhone code and TCP IP interactions, protocol exchanges, and so on. Even though it might be less obvious of its meaning, looks a bit muddled and we don't understand the language and so on. But if we took long enough to piece those things together, we might see that emergent thing appear, perhaps by machine learning, right? That's that's the approach. Mm-hmm. You, you look at the smaller bits and see, do they form any patterns in the long mm-hmm. term, or statistically? And then you try to build up a picture from that. This is how we do science. So learning is clearly a key strategy in uh, moving from one scale to another. But those those higher level things then form constraints on the behavior of the smaller things mm-hmm. because they tend to be more massive, perhaps harder to move, controlled by another set of causal uh, mm-hmm. sources or primitives or whatever. And so they act as they are they appear to be so-called static boundary conditions mm-hmm. on the problem. Mm-hmm or apparent invariance, I would use my physics language, mm-hmm. invariance, mm-hmm. things that don't change, constants. Um, and so whether or not something is constant or variable depends very much on you know how, f- how fast you are yourself. Mm-hmm. So our galaxy seems to be pretty invariant, but actually it's very dynamical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just it takes billions of years to, to see any difference, whereas we are quite sort of... Uh, much, much mm-hmm. faster beings, we'd be dead in no time. And so we don't really see the, the fixed stars. Mm-hmm. At all. So in the same way, it's like having the fixed stars uh, because they change at such a slow rate relative to our time scales. Mm-hmm. We don't see those changes, so we think of them as constants. Mm-hmm. And this is how scales separate across multiple levels mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's an interesting concept here in the notion of invariances and, and constancy, probably even symmetries, that it's not a, a objective thing, but rather a relative scale thing where one one part is moving relatively or slower than the other part. So long as there's that discrepancy speed of two systems, then we have some sort of constancy. We can conjure up a notion of constancy. Uh, this is the way we have predictability, right? So machine learning or any kind of learning would never work unless the memories we retain were long lived compared to the phenomena we used to learn about. Mm -hmm. So if the rules of the world changed faster than the memories we could keep, Mm -hmm. memory would Mm -hmm. not be a useful thing to have. And so it's, it's only because of that separation of scales that memory learning uh, leads to any kind of predictability, basically the observation that, what has happened in the past can become a prediction for what may happen in the future. Mm-hmm. And seeing that pattern again repeated in the future mm-hmm. allows us to reason about it and and make use of it because we know what to expect. Mm-hmm. Now, in, in the fields of neuroscience and psychology, there's this notion that is uh, very hard to uh, pin down, I, I guess, for, for the fields is this notion of representation. What is representation? There are psychological theories that say we don't need representation at all. There are others, of course, that say that's counterintuitive to what we know. I don't know who came up with the idea, but there's this notion of representation having to do with the constancy of things, that a representation exists because there's some sort of constant or invariant thing that exists between the relative speed of two different processes. Yep. Um, again, this sort of all comes back to language and process in some way. Representation theory is a branch of mathematics in which you 
you use a certain language to represent a particular phenomenon or a particular structure. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have a group or a symmetry. Um, you can represent that symmetry perhaps as a diagram, or you could represent it as a matrix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could represent it as an algebra, or you could represent, you know, mm -hmm. and each of these things behave different ways. Mm -hmm. They have different kinds of agents. They make slightly different kinds of promises. Mm -hmm. But the patterns that they form Mm -hmm. according to their own rules, reproduce the same phenomena in an abstract sense. Mm -hmm. You can create a mapping one-to-one -one between these, or not necessarily one-to-one, -one, but at least you can create a mapping to say that this maps to that, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and therefore is a representation of it. So to say that representations don't exist is kind of dumb, because mm -hmm. you need some representation to be able mm -hmm. to talk about it. Just yes, by talking yes. about it, there's a representation right there. Mm -hmm. And each one basically bootstraps off some process like talking or writing or mm -hmm. putting symbols down or multiplying matrices or whatever it is. Um, so representation is extremely important. Some mm -hmm. are more efficient than others. And I guess it depends on the capabilities of the agents involved, mm -hmm. which is the best kind of approach mm -hmm. to 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 doing it and sometimes there are limitations in in certain kinds of representation which make them hard to understand so right. for example if we were going to represent human language as a matrix problem or as a feature vector in machine mm -hmm. learning, massive amount of resources uh, to make that happen uh, much bigger than the size of a book mm -hmm. right, which could teach you to read english or chinese mm -hmm. or anything else so the construction of languages and symbolic representations is an extremely important approach mm -hmm. to compressing data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can say that a language is the compression of a process that unfolds as the language, as you read the language. Mm -hmm. So AI, in AI, I use this metaphor uh, that comes from Daniel Kahneman, uh, thinking fast and slow. Um, that is, there's this fast parallel process that is unconscious, and there's a slower, deliberately uh, reflective kind of thinking. And uh, this notion is actually applicable when you're working with large language models, in that if you want to get greater accuracy in a response for a large language model, you create a chain of thought, essentially. So you have it to um, smaller steps. So you see this in uh, Google's Gemini where they're able to match uh, GPT-4 by having a chain of 30 thoughts. But the fundamental reason why that works is that each individual, individual thought uh, conjures up a representation in language that it can use as the base for the next thought. I actually used this same approach in a different representation in my CF engine and configuration management mm -hmm. system years ago. Basically, what they're doing is separating... So thinking fast and slow, it's a separation of scales, mm -hmm. fast and slow. The, the fast scale is a representation of context. It's a mm -hmm. mirror of the things occurring around you, the processes that you're engaged in, sensing. So it's the sensing. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a state representation of what's going on, your train of thought, if you will. Um, so it's just kind of short-term memory. Your long-term thinking is... Which of those, um, which of those sequences of short-term things become invariants and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. repeated structures that we can use again and again? And <clears throat> I wrote a couple of papers, well, I don't know, five years ago or so now, about how this um, this uh, combination of short-term things eventually coalesce into a larger concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, what's interesting about these short-term representations of state is that they were they they are sort of visceral things, right? They're because they're sensory things, mm -hmm. they're related to how we feel about the world. So and they're closely related to emotional responses as well. So when we feel a certain way about a chain of reasoning, that's when we think we, we're we happy to sort of terminate that chain and say, okay, we're, we finished that computation now. Mm -hmm. but you can all, the problem with reasoning is it doesn't have an end. It, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, there's no mm -hmm. 
terminating um halting problem if you mm -hmm, will mm -hmm. is to end a chain of reasoning like are we there yet or, or mm -hmm. why why mum why is this true well because of that yeah but why is that true mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. you keep saying why 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 or are we there yet are we there yet on and on until at some point you feel okay oh, i recognize that thing and i feel good about it okay mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. so every chain of reasoning actually ends with an emotional uh, terminator that says, I am happy to accept that as the conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that builds up is a scaling thing. You see certain patterns occur again and again, and you, you see the ones that become invariants by being repetitive over time. Mm -hmm. And they often have quite unexpected interpretations. So for example, I did this, um, I did a text analysis of, of various books and one of them was Moby Dick because you know Moby Dick is the only book mm -hmm. people work. <laughs> um, and you would think that when you analyze this, the the invariance in in Moby Dick, of course it would be about whales, but it's not. Um, what came out of my analysis was not anything much to do with the sea or with whales. It was about f frustration, emotional frustration and revenge and feelings of um you know human feelings mm -hmm. which are basically the story of ahab and his uh, his obsession with the whale so mm -hmm. actually from a machine learning perspective the book the the, the concepts that emerge uh from the book alone without any knowledge of language apart from you know just analyzing the statistics of the words what comes out of that is a bunch of words about emotions uh the, mm -hmm. the feelings the book are representing and of course if you know a lot about other things you can then see that yeah of course the words represent things about whales but because you didn't have any other information to go on except what you read in the book uh you don't know what about you don't know what a whale is mm -hmm. not really explained in the book so when you encapsulate data and a stream of, of evidence or learning training materials, if you will, um, the scope of that material may not contain the things you think it does. When you, for example, we, as humans, we learn from an early age, we you know, take 20, 50 years to learn our view of the world and learn what whales are and, and emotions are and scales and virtual machines and so on. All of these things come to us over many, many years for many, many interactions. And it takes a long, long time to form those things. We try to reproduce that with a data problem by training specifically for a thing we believe we know what it is. Well, we're imposing that belief what, that we know what it is already from the beginning. So we're starting with a bias about mm -hmm. what we've learned something actually is, and then trying to get the machine to respond to that which it will do within the scope of that limited data. But the concepts it will emerge with will not necessarily be the ones that we thought we were impressing upon it. They will be the ones that are, are the invariants in the mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. uh, and they may be quite different things to what mm -hmm. we Yeah, so uh, one of the ways that I can think about the limitations of today's uh, deep learning systems is that uh, the way they actually um, conjure up the the uh, concepts is it's massively curve fitting. In other words, there are these um, um, equations with thousands and millions of coefficients. So it's it's not compressed in the way that humans have concepts. So because it's not compressed they can't derive alternative viewpoints because it's just spread out. So the question is, if we're trying to build AIs that can do abstractions, how do you think about that from the perspective of your ideas in the smart space time? It's a very interesting um, problem. And last year, I think it was, um, I was invited to be part of the Kavli uh, Institute Foundation's neuroscience uh, workshop Work, working together with a bunch of neuroscientists about how the brain works. And, um, the brain is obviously some kind of a network and it's it has a certain number of operations that are 
very sort of promise theory like in certain ways. But one thing that's interesting about the brain is that it doesn't just represent positive uh, promises or signals about things that are, it also has blocking signals. So mm. there, are, there are neurons that deactivate certain Inhibit. uh, right. inhibiting neurons, exactly, inhibitory neurons. This we don't have so much in computer science. We tend not to know how to sol perform selections from um, from ranges of possibilities. So how do we pick out the things of relevance and deactivate certain contexts uh, in a negative way by saying not those? This is what we could call counterfactual reasoning in a sense. Um, we're not as good at that in, in computer science as we as as natural systems are. In biology, again, going back to the biology biological thing, we have evolution that has selection, natural selection, killing off stuff. Mm -hmm. And in the level of cells, we have apoptosis, uh, you know, programmed cell death, mm -hmm. uh, and and even necrotic cell death, which basically select away certain mm -hmm. things, uh, tissue which form reasoning systems. We don't think about biological processes as reasoning systems unless it's the brain in normally but actually mm -hmm. one of the most powerful reasoning systems in our bodies is the immune system mm -hmm. which is able to uh, respond to certain stimuli and reject certain stimuli and then switch itself off after a certain time to resolve mm -hmm. and i will stop attacking the body after a certain amount of time because the conditions are no longer suitable for doing that. And then some, sometimes that goes wrong and people have autoimmune disease and so on. So uh, these systemic scales at which things are being switched on and switched off with multiple pathways and invariance and recognition of patterns through all kinds of languages at all kinds of scales, these are the complex things that lead to reasoning at many levels. And you could perhaps say that this is why biology is, is is complex, but also why biology has been so successful in adapting and mm -hmm. become resilient to certain um, challenges from the environment. Whereas our um, technological systems that are built to be so much more compressed and specific, mm -hmm. they are much more rigid and therefore more brittle and therefore, they obviously fail uh, uh, much more brittly as well, and uh, more catastrophically, you would say, mathematically. Um, so I guess what we're learning to do in AI and with machine learning is make, go more to that embracing of complexity and multi-scale phenomena that biology has learned how to embrace and imitate that using various uh, tactics. What we do today is tend to put everything, you know, we take a thousand dimensional space or something, and then we put things into mm -hmm. this, and we try to search it. Searching a 1,000 dimensional space is pretty hard, time-consuming uh, computational task to do. If you could reduce that to three dimensions or, or two or one to a single trajectory, then you're obviously doing much better. A single trajectory, one dimension, that's deterministic. Two mm -hmm. dimensions, then you've you've reduced it uh, an enormous amount, and you you have some symmetries left that you could then try to eliminate by uh, presenting some of these counterfactual points to make a selection. Mm -hmm. So how do we break these symmetries that we see in our reasoning? Well, the answer to this question could be a thousand things. Uh, well, well, here's a here's a counterfactual point. Oh, that eliminates. 30% of them. Okay, great. So it's like Sherlock Holmes. We try to eliminate uh, and break and narrow things down to the mm -hmm. small set. And then what, what we're left with, however improbable, is some kind of truth, at least in that. So great. We've hit the one hour mark. And this was a really good, deep conversation with a lot of ideas springing. And I hope we can do this again. Sure. It's been fun.